one of the best researched supplements in terms of muscle strength and performance in the entire world is creatine monohydrate, but you may not be as familiar with some of its other very important benefits, such as the benefits to bone health and brain health. And on today's podcast, I'm welcoming creatine researcher, Dr. Darren Kandow to the show to really fill us in on what are some of the most interesting newest developments on what we know about creatine's other important benefits. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for being with me today. Before we go any further, hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app and also head over to YouTube, subscribe there and ring the bell for more notifications. I'm really excited to welcome creatine researcher, Dr. Darren Kandow to the podcast, because today we are diving into some of the newer research on creatine's potential benefits for things like bone health, and the brain, really looking at things like cognition, mood, and so much more. It turns out, as of course, I'm sure you suspect, there are so many benefits to creatine other than just its benefits for muscle. And there are specifically some differences in things like dosing that you may want to consider. So keep listening for all of that. And before we dive in, if you are a woman over 40 and you're really trying to maximize strength, muscle, and performance, you know that it's time to do things differently than when you were in your 20s, but you're not quite sure how to do that, how to work with your changing physiology, then Strength Nutrition Unlocked is the program for you. This is my group program. It's going to help you weave together evidence-based principles on fueling, training, and recovery, and of course, provide the coaching and support that you need to really implement this long-term and see the best possible outcomes, then check out Strength Nutrition Unlocked and apply over at stephgodrow.com slash apply. All right, let's go ahead and dive into this episode with Dr. Darren Kandow. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kandow. Hi, how are you? I'm so good. I'm super stoked to do this with you today, uh, getting into even more topics about creatine because let's be honest, um, people need to hear about it. And it's also probably paradoxically the thing that we have so many questions about, at least in, yeah. in terms of supplementation. So thanks for right. being here on the show. No, thanks for having me. I'm really passionate with this. It should be ex very exciting and informative. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You're kind of like the godfather of, of creatine <laughs> research. So I'm, I'm really pumped when you kind of contacted me through sure. uh, Instagram DMs and we started chatting back and forth and we've had uh, Scott Forbes on the show before, um, you know, just to recap for the listener, like I did a review on um, what the sort of current body of literature says mm -hmm. about um, women and creatine um, across the lifespan. And that was Abby Smith Ryan's, um, mm -hmm. you know, paper that she had it up. So, you know, even since then though, I'm sure a ton of stuff has changed and we were talking about just even the more recent developments, what's to come. And so it's just like, it doesn't seem like this area of research shows any signs of slowing down. No, it's, it's actually taken off more than we probably thought it could. And it was like a roller coaster. We had a whole bunch of momentum going in the late 1990s and consistently for a bit. And then it's taken off a new clinical and health aspects of it now. So uh, that's kind of where it's at. And uh, I hope I'm a good messenger with all the great researchers around the world doing great stuff. And uh, yeah. yeah, let's, uh, it'll be a great discussion. <laughs> Y'all are the real heroes, like out there doing all the research and, and really putting in the time and the effort and, you know, uh, getting the funding. And I don't think people necessarily re like realize the scope of you know, we just kind of see the, 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 the average person out in the world, who's not in the science research, like they might see a headline on their favorite news outlet. Right. Yeah. And it, it might be that kind of, um, uh, snapshot it's turned into like some common speak, mm -hmm. but if you kind of take it back and, and I thought this could be an interesting thing to really talk about yeah. is like, you all just had, um, a big study come out that was like a two year, um, trial in Canada. Mm -hmm. And you were giving me some statistics on this when we were chatting and it was like, this is a huge undertaking. Like mm -hmm. how can you walk the, the listener yeah. through like kind of the broad brushstrokes of how do you even get to like, what kind of work is involved? How do you get to that point of doing something like a two-year trial Yeah. by the time it gets to them and they see it on TV or something like what all has gone into that? Yeah, I think this is a really underappreciated area. I think a lot of people on social media, for example, you know, a lot of in individuals will post that they publish a paper. And then all of a sudden people say, gee, it must be easy to publish in a journal because you guys seem to be doing it more frequently. And 
And I look at them and I'm like, oh my God, only if you knew behind the scenes. And, and for just say, for example, for a six week study, it probably takes 12 months to complete from start to finish. Uh, and the cost is, is extraordinary. So depending on what you do, for example, the, the one we just talked about, it was a two year study with supervised exercise and creatine every day in over 200 postmenopausal females. I wrote the grant with a colleague in 2003, or sorry, 2013. Yeah, that's still a long time. <laughs> and then the trial didn't get completed until 2019. And then it took us a few years to comply all the data, all the blood and, and uh, urine analysis. And then it just came out. So an entire decade of work on one study, which the person watching or whatever might say, oh, that's really cool. It was over a thousand hours of research and it cost over half a million dollars. So it was an enormous undertaking. It was the largest RCT ever uh, been shown to combine exercise. Good colleagues of mine uh, in Brazil have looked at two years in postmenopausal women without exercise. But the appreciation for the amount of work is unbelievable. And the ironic thing is, a lot of us researchers have very minimal followers. Uh, I would say maybe a few thousand where social influencers can have millions and they sort of get all the fame and glory, which is fine. I mean, we're not in this academia for uh, the fame and glory, but behind the scenes, it's, it's an enormous amount of work. And, and I think that's why us acad uh, academics or, or, or teachers or professors, whichever it is, are so proud of when we publish something, we sort of jump for joy because it, it's a huge undertaking to do that. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of work. And I think the knowledge translation uh, in that study, especially for postmenopausal females, maybe it can improve bone strength. Could that ever reduce the risk of fracture potentially in the hip? That would have enormous implications for your mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, and for young females that are growing up, try to build up their bone strength as much as possible. And, and so I can't wait to talk about this the rest of the time, but mm -hmm. I, I love that intro. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So I studied uh, biology, human physiology uh, in my undergrad, and I was working pretty closely um, with some of the researchers that were looking at things like endocrine disruption and right. almost went into sort of, um, you know, post undergrad research with one of them, but yeah, just like to even to kind of glean at that point, yeah. you know, as an undergrad, like gleaning all the things that go into, um, and the time and the effort and the, and like truly dedication. And you have to have that passion for it right. because, um, uh, like you said, you're, you're maybe not the, um, the ones who are <laughs> like able to, you know, you see your names on the paper, but like, again, to the average person, they're sort of like, they're seeing the headlines, seeing the topic, you know, but they're not appreciating like, exactly. so have you've exactly. been studying this for like your entire professional career. So. Yeah. I, uh, it's been two decades at least. And, uh, I first started with some excellent colleagues by chance in 2001 was the first paper, I guess. Mm. Uh, and now it's 2023 and, I, I have double digits of papers in review and working on, so we're still toying <laughs> with the, the questions and things that people are really interested in. Uh, you know, does creatine cause baldness may be the most popular one I get on a daily basis, but uh, <laughs> uh, we can take it from there. For sure. What, what initially, you know, got you interested in creatine as a, an area of study? Yeah, it was by chance. So I was mm. actually uh, kind of looking at the amino acid glutamine for my master's uh, because there was a lot of uh, sort of hype, I guess, in marketing behind this uh, non-essential amino acid. Uh, could it actually be taken by athletes to improve uh, muscle performance? And we gave the highest dosage uh, in any study and it, it was kind of worthless. It was no different than placebo. And, um, and it makes sense. It's a non-essential amino acid we can naturally create. The only times it may work is if you have cancer, sepsis, or, or other types of metabolic disease. And so it was kind of cool to show that something that was very popular uh, did not work. And if you look at the total body of research, in my opinion, glutamine is probably one of the most worthless supplements for a healthy individual to take. Um, so that was good to get information out there to people to say, hey, maybe save your money. And at the same time, creatine was just sort of getting a lot of momentum. Lymphor Christie won the gold medal at the Olympics in the late 1990s. Uh, two seminal papers came out in 1992 and 96, simply showing that a high dose of creatine, a really, really small amount, could have the same effect by saturating the muscle. And if you have more energy currency in your muscle cell, that's what creatine does. Could that allow you to do more repetitions, maybe exercise longer, 
and just as importantly, recover at a faster rate from the gym and maybe allow you to maintain a, an exercise frequency. And then I would guess there's well over a thousand studies that have looked at creatine. But now the emphasis has gone from athletes to more clinical populations, the average individual taken for health. We have a lot of emphasis now on the neck up, cognition, concussion, um, bone health, and, and of course, muscle. Uh, so it's become a total body supplement. Uh, not just for athletes looking to get bigger, stronger, faster. I think anybody on the planet, um, I'm really struggling to find anybody on the planet that would not benefit from creatine in some form or another. Mm. I, you know, I think it's always so serendipitous how people stumble into the things mm -hmm. that they're really, you know, they either end up devoting a, a good part of their life's work to, they're also hopefully really passionate about. Right. So I appreciate that. Cause I think sometimes out in the world, like even people who are maybe newer coaches, mm -hmm. newer trainers, nutritionists, um, et cetera, are like, Oh, I have to have it all figured out. And like, I have to know what is the thing that's going to just really, you know, take my interest. And sometimes you just never know, you're just going to maybe stumble upon it and, um, it could change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, I was thinking about what, what kind of fun questions did I ask you? And so I thought of this one, um, to kind of kick it off. What is one of the most obscure slash, I don't know, maybe strange things about creatine that people like have no idea, like maybe something super interesting, something really unexpected. Um, because oh. we, again, we hear about like all this stuff, yeah, creatine is for meat, for meatheads and it's for yeah. the gym, but anything that you feel like is really just super, super cool and, and out there. Yeah, and it, I, I, you know, I think the the information on bone health, which we'll talk about, is kind of in its infancy, and not a lot of people uh, know about that. The beneficial effects for pregnancy, mm. um, that's an emerging area as well. But I think the big one is from the neck up now, the brain, cognition, memory, and it really only seems to work overall when the brain is stressed. So I think this is an interesting thing for students to uh, uh, night uh, shift workers. When you're going through sleep deprivation or times of metabolic stress when the brain is really fatigued, uh, that seems to be why creatine at really high dosages for long periods of time may be effective. But overall, it seems that the dosage of creatine is really starting to come into question depending on the tissue that it is. So I think one of the biggest things is people said, oh, I've heard three to five grams a day is great. That's potentially only for one tissue of your body. What if you're taking it for bone health or brain? It's totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I think is a little uh, eye-opening for a lot of people. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we definitely talk about creatine a lot in terms of the the performance aspect, like muscular performance and things of that nature. So I'm excited to dig into some of these other topics a little yeah, bit more yeah. with you. Um, so first, I wonder if we can circle back around to the the two year trial that y'all did in Canada right. and talk about the bone health aspect again. Like I think there are a lot of people listening to this podcast who are in the 40 and over category, mostly women, um, who are concerned about things like um, you know their bone health, um, osteopenia, osteoporosis, especially as we're aging. And I think in the U S alone by 2060, there's going to be, is it 90 million women over the age of 50? Like yes. it, it's just a, a growing, growing population. Okay. So in terms of the bone health aspect, can you run through a little bit more about what uh, you kind of gave the, the brush, the brush strokes, yeah. but what did that try? What did you learn from that trial? And like, what are some of the subtleties that people might miss again, if they're out in the world and they were like, Oh, this big study was done with creatine and, and bone. Um, what were some of the things that you found that you think are really interesting for people to know? Yeah, the foundation was based on some rodent model and, and some healthy older adult models. So when you combine resistance training and creatine supplementation, it's very well established that muscle will go up. And the theory was that if you have more muscle, it's going to be pulling on the bone when you're exercising. So could that stimulate bone growth? And if it could, that has enormous implications for, again, both sexes, but primarily females who may be more prone to osteoporosis or age-related bone loss. And so one of the best populations to assess this is postmenopausal females, where the cessation of estrogen is complete. And we went a little bit further. So normally you define postmenopause as 12 months last menses. We did 24 months to ensure everybody was in an equal about. And to be properly statistically powered, you need a really high sample size. So we were extremely fortunate to get over 200 postmenopausal females to volunteer for this study. And they were randomized into two groups, creatine or placebo. But our previous data suggested that 
the typical dose, which, you know, most people say five grams was not nearly high enough to not only induce an increase in muscle mass, but potentially bone. So we did something very unique. We did a relative dose. So if everybody went on the scale, you would know how much you weigh in kilograms. We gave the highest dose that has ever been shown to be effective, 0 0.14 gram per kilogram. So if you're 70 kilograms, that female is taking almost 10 grams of creatine a day. They took it every single day, including off days for two straight years. Hmm. Now, most people say, whoa, I thought you were only supposed to take five grams a day for a little bit and take time off. We see no evidence that you need the creatine cycle. Not only did we give creatine every day for two straight years, but we measured uh, liver and, or sorry, liver and kidney uh, function from blood and urine analysis to make sure it was safe every six months. And lo and behold, when you looked at the totality of the data, two years of a very high dose of creatine and resistance training plus six days of walking, it did not have a beneficial effect on bone mineral density, which we did hypothesize, but it did increase bone strength. So what does this mean? If you were to take your pencil or pen, the bone is more flexible or, or resistant to breakage, whereas the placebo group, it might crack more. So if you think of your femur or hip region, if you were to fall on an icy road, the individuals on creatine may be able to withstand that fall better. So it improved bone strength and World Health Organization uses bone strength as a main predictor for functionality and, and osteoporosis. And not only did it improve some of these bone geometry uh, principles, but it also caused individuals on creatine to improve their walking speed. Mm -hmm. So this allowed these individuals to walk faster, which is a measure of functional ability. And for the viewers that are familiar with sarcopenia, that is now used as a main criteria to diagnose that clinical condition. And finally, in a group that were considered compliers to the resistance training exercise, uh, walking and creatine, they improved lean tissue mass. Now, there's some hesitation with improving lean tissue mass because it's not muscle mass, but lean tissue mass is still correlated with a lot of beneficial things and primarily glucose disposal. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's familiar with type 2 diabetes knows that the more lean tissue you have, the more glucose can enter the cell. So all in all, it was very beneficial. Uh, strength uh, did not go up, maybe because the resistance training program was equally beneficial. But just as important, there was absolutely no greater side effects over two years on the creatine group on a high dose compared to placebo. Mm -hmm. So what we're starting to see now, when you look at all the data, three to five grams has zero effect on bone health. If anything, a higher dose, eight grams or more can have a small beneficial effect on bone mineral density and or bone strength. Um, but the cool thing is 10 grams or more for two straight years had no greater effect from a side effect perspective. So I think it's something to really consider. Yeah, I appreciate you going through that. And I think for the listener, there's going to be a distinction here in a couple of things that you said. And and again, this is why it's so great to talk yeah. to people like yourself with such a deep knowledge, because what folks hear in the world, you know, maybe it gets translated through somebody like me. And I'll be the first to say mm -hmm. <laughs> there are probably things that I miss as well. I'm not a researcher. I'm just somebody who understands how to translate from right. you know what the science says to to more of a practical takeaway but they'll hear things like bone. And then you, you were talking about bone mineral density versus something like bone strength right. and how those might be, uh, related in some way, but they're not necessarily the same metric right. or have the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So bone mineral density is well established in the osteoporosis world. It's kind of just thinking the weight of your bone, the density of the bone got stronger. Uh, whereas the strength means the bending of strength when it's under compression. And when you look at all the data, we don't really see a great beneficial effect, if any, uh, from creatine on bone mineral density. We definitely see an effect on bone strength. And the other cool thing is when you think of an anti-catabolic effect, any of your viewers that are taking bisphosphonates, that's an anti-catabolic drug. Creatine really seems to have some beneficial effects by reducing bone breakdown. Mm -hmm. So it sort of preserves the skeleton. And then if you add in resistance training and put on more muscle mass, maybe you get a total effect of increasing uh, muscle mass, maintaining or strengthening the bone. And we can actually talk about some of the effects, small effects of creatine on reducing fat mass uh, in young and older adults as well. Yeah, for sure. And it kind of the next thing that you said too, which I want to, to like reiterate for people is you're talking about the difference between muscle mass and lean mass. Right. And from a research, like, you know, uh, physiological perspective, what does that be, actually mean? 
Yeah. So if, if you, if for anybody on the viewers, they go on their scale, the BIA or get a DEXA scan. And, and sometimes they get really alarmed when they jump on it and says their lean tissue is this or percent body fat. So most lab measures of lean tissue mass are probably are primarily done through something called underwater weighing or air displacement plasmography or a DEXA scan, which a lot of individuals, parents have gone to the hospital and got a bone mineral density scan. The main issue with lean tissue Again, this is not muscle mass. Lean tissue encompasses muscle, uh, water, organs, blood, but it also uh, encompasses something called fibrotic tissue. So a whole bunch of things in the cell, whereas more sophisticated technology using a muscle biopsy or some 3D or even 4D imaging can look at pure muscle. So if you increase or decrease lean tissue, that is not the same as an increase or decrease in muscle mass. And so that's just something for a lot of the viewers to, to be aware of. Uh, and again, that's more important when you go to a personal trainer and they measure your lean tissue mass and it may be as high or low as you were thinking. That's not the same as measuring a muscle biopsy and looking at proteins in the muscle. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so, it, cause it is, there's like some subtleties here and sometimes we, we, in, in the world, we like interchange certain mm -hmm. terms and it can, we can start to lose a little bit of the definition. Yes. Um, like if you kind of squint, you're like, okay, yeah. like that's sort of in the, in the right realm, but the, the, the details really matter here. Right. And so you mentioned, uh, just before talking about things like fat mass, can you mm -hmm. talk about that too? Because I know that a lot of people are, you know, they're concerned, they're thinking about, especially for postmenopausal or like through the menopause transition, mm -hmm. like we know for women, the risk of cardiovascular disease rises. We have, we talk about things like visceral yeah. fat and so on and so forth. So what does, um, what does this particular study show about things like fat mass and how that might change with creatine? Yeah. So the two-year data, uh, fat mass was basically unchanged over time in two years, but the cool thing is it did not go up and it, it had minimal effect on any changes, but we did perform in two, uh, two years ago, a meta-analysis looking at adults 50 and above, uh, looking at the effects of creatine on fat mass changes, absolute fat mass in, in kilograms, as well as percent body fat. And the interesting thing is older adults, 15 above, combined with resistance training, they lost 0 0.55 kilograms of fat. Now, when you extrapolate that here in Canada, less than two pounds, or in the United States, 0 0.55 kilograms, that's probably insignificant from a big picture perspective. But I argue, well, wait a minute, there was a lot of big myths about creatine causing a lot of water retention, and a lot of people said they felt fatter. And I'm saying, well, if you combine exercise with creatine, you're showing a small reduction. That's huge for clinical obesity and, and type 2 diabetes. But percent body fat was statistically significant. So that means these individuals lost a little amount of body fat. In general, they would have probably put on lean tissue mass or muscle mass with creatine. So I think that has massive implications from a, a body recomposition perspective. Uh, and we're just doing the younger adult meta-analysis now. Mm -hmm. And I guess I can say this, the results are identical. So if you're under 50, it was a mirror image. So mm -hmm. we can conclude basically if you're 18 years and above, creatine and resistance training will decrease fat a little amount. It will not increase it. Mm -hmm. And therefore that has implications for a lot of chronic diseases, maybe later on in life, obesity, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome. But the big thing I'm, I'm getting interested in is uh, type two diabetes and mm -hmm. the huge increase in fat. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, we, <laughs> you and I talked about this on our direct messages, mm -hmm. um, how one of the biggest, and I appreciate you bringing up like that the, 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 the fat mass change was, you know, slight and maybe not like massive, but there was no fat mass increase. Um, I think that's important for women, especially to hear as they're going through, um, perimenopause, right. menopause transition, there can be redistribution of, of fat stores, for example. And a lot of people really just go through a tough body image time at this time of their right. lives and, you know, time and time and time again. And I, I know I see it from my perspective, from my side of things. And I'm curious what, what you see when you're running these studies mm -hmm. is that women will start taking creatine. They get super excited. They're like, okay, this is going to have so many benefits for me. And then they're like, I feel puffy or like yes. the scale went up or, and they just freak out. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I say that with a lot of love and compassion because there was definitely a time 
10, 15, 20 years ago, where if I started taking a, you know, maybe I started taking creatine and I got on the scale and every day it was like, if the scale went up, forget it. It was like a, a disaster, right? So what can you, like, any insight you can share? Cause you were talking about even uh, a higher dose than, you know, five grams, which is kind of that three to five range. What do you see? And like, how, how can do you have any insight about yeah. how do we like get around or deal with that subtlety here of like the scale might increase, but it's, it's not fat mass. Like, and right. I always call it hashtag muscle water, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, for people, but what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah. It's definitely the biggest barrier, especially for females to participate in a research study. Mm -hmm. So let's back it up a little bit. The yeah. most water retention that will occur is during the loading phase, which can be effective and used in certain populations, but it's not needed. So the loading phase is typically 20 grams a day. And keep in mind, we're only producing naturally about two to three grams. So again, you're taking in 10 times as amount uh, as what we're naturally making. So 20 grams a day for about five to seven days is a very effective way to saturate the muscle. That's been shown time and time again to be probably the most rapid way to do that. But creatine is a unique compound. It's something called osmotic. It will drag water from your blood around demanding tissues and primarily its muscle mass. So very common with the loading phase, people say, geez, I increased my body mass on a scale by one to three kilograms uh, during the week. Some males love that. Some females love that. But most young females do not like that and they withdraw. Um, so depending on the aesthetics of the population, the, the sport they're in, body fluctuations may not be viable. What we've done is shown that maybe a really small dosage can be ingested more frequent throughout the day. And that primarily does not lead to a bulk or bolus water retention. So for those that are very susceptible to water retention, I say do not do the loading phase. Okay. You can reduce it as low as three grams a day. If you're looking at it from a muscle perspective, as low as three grams a day, it'll take about 30 days to saturate your muscle. And then you can take three day or three grams a day if you want, or a little bit more, uh, basically till the day you die, if you're looking at it from a muscle overall uh, potential performance perspective. And I even go, you could take that three grams a day in one gram dosages with breakfast, lunch, dinner. It will accumulate in the muscle. Um, there's some evidence from Roger Harris who showed that one gram per ingestion may not be enough to get into the cell. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're going to do three grams a day, you can just take that in one bolus if you want or divide it up. Uh, in our lab, we typically do 0 0.1 gram per kilogram across all uh, uh, ages. And so again, if you're 70 kilograms, that's seven grams a day. If you're 10 kilograms or 100 kilograms, you're taking 10 grams a day. And we simply divide that in two dosages. Uh, sometime with a meal. And we like to give one right after exercise because I think your transport kinetics are, are activated. So if a female or male is very susceptible to water retention, I say take your daily dose and divide it up into more smaller frequent dosages. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm glad that, you know, we have some practical <laughs> takeaways here yeah. um, because I hear this so often and, you know, usually it comes down to, like you said, there's they're loading. And mm -hmm. so like, can we back that off and just you know, as long as there's no rush to, uh, you know, you don't have like a competition or something coming up and, and that can cause some of the concerns, you know, yeah. being in a, 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 in, and around weight class sports, like for basically my whole, my whole athletic, um, career, like it, it can be a concern for people, but I think to your point, like there are other ways to approach it and it's just, yeah. you know, staying the course, if you will. And, and the other big one was, is with caffeine. So this is really important to be clear here. If you plan on taking creatine and caffeine for more than a week, maybe you're taking it for resistance training, please don't mix them together. Mm -hmm. The only there's good evidence to suggest that more than three days of creatine in combination with caffeine can blunt each other. So I'm a coffee junkie and most people are. So if you're going to consume the two, I say simply consume your coffee or caffeine pre-workout and your in your creatine after mm. um and pre-workouts have a combination of a whole bunch of things in there so you never know what's working um but the good cellular data say creatine and caffeine oppose each other at, at a really important compartment in the muscle and we showed uh last year actually that in a very small population but the group who took creatine and caffeine powder together for several weeks of resistance training did not get the same benefit from one measure of a muscle uh, compared to creatine alone. So there's indirect evidence 
or theory that they can't interfere with one another. Um, so I think that's another thing that your viewers may want to consider at least. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody wants, and I am, I'm a coffee lover myself, but everybody wants to put everything in their coffee mm -hmm. in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you gotta, yeah. gotta be a little bit. Um, and, know, and that goes with the timing of creatine is pretty much irrelevant. You can take yeah. creatine at any time of the day. Uh, there's really no different pre, during, or post. Uh, but I really promote post-exercise creatine because you decreased all the energy stores and turned on a whole bunch of things in the body with exercise. And if creatine can be there in the in the body with an increase in blood flow or transport kinetics, uh, that's a very viable strategy. And you could also argue using that logic, take it before exercise when things are activated. So those are two very viable strategies that people can use. For sure. Yeah. I usually just sip on mine like uh, yeah. bef before, like as I'm going through training and then I yes. finish it up after I'm done. Yeah. Um, all right. I do so, the same thing. I do the yeah. same thing. Yeah. yeah. I make like my, you know, shaker bottle yeah. and I've got my electrolytes in there and yeah. my creatine and then I just like sip on it as I'm going yes. through. So just yeah. keeping it easy. Yeah. Um, I right, should I would... point out that exercise is probably the best way to get creatine into the muscle. So muscle mm -hmm. contractions really stimulate it. Carbohydrates and protein can do that as well. But if, for someone who's really trying to maximize the amount of creatine uptake, prior exercise or muscle contractions is the best way. It's almost like that's just <laughs> how things are designed to work, right? It's like, yes. can we take advantage of all of those things that those like great beneficial effects that we get from, exactly. you know, actually getting the muscle to contract and, and yeah. challenging ourselves with, um, you know, lifting appropriate enough loads so that we're getting those maximal contractions and using yes. all our muscle fibers. Um, I love it. I could nerd on that uh, nerd yeah. out on that stuff all day. I would love though, to shift a little bit and talk about some of the above the next stuff as, yes. as you called it, because I think that again, with this population, um, even as athletic folks, you know, I'm in my mid forties. A lot of people listening to the show are like maybe creeping up to their forties or in their fifties as well. And we're starting to think about things like seeing our, you know, friends and family aging and like maybe taking care of parents or seeing how, uh, cognition, memory, um, yeah. mood, like all of those things. And you mentioned stress earlier can play into, um, you know, or starting to be born out in some of the creatine research. So I would love to kind of <laughs> say, pick your brain, no pun intended yeah. on, um, sort of some of the things, I guess maybe a good place to start would be something like, um, memory, um, mm -hmm. since that, you know, again, is something people are kind of noticing. Maybe they're like, Oh, I've kind of like brain foggy or, yeah. um, stuff that's going on there. So what do we know about creatine in the brain, creatine in memory, some of these things? Yeah, so this, we have to sort of lay the foundation why it's different than muscle. So our muscle does not create creatine itself. In the body, creatine is primarily created in the kidney and liver. And oh, it actually is created in the brain. So right off the bat, there's a big difference, which may turn on a light bulb and say, oh, the dosage might be a bit different. Mm -hmm. So from the neck up, it's very protective. We all know that the brain has something called the blood-brain barrier. It does not allow things into the brain it doesn't want to. And the brain is also very unique. It can synthesize its own creatine. So unlike muscle, which relies on our diet or our natural production, the brain can make it, it itself. So if the brain is making creatine itself, you would speculate, oh, maybe it's resistant to supplementation. And if it's kind of resistant, maybe you need a much higher dose for a longer period of time to accumulate. And that's kind of where we're starting to see the differences in dosing. So... Creatine supplementation has been shown to increase brain creatine content. Even the supplement can get into the brain by about, on average, 6%. But this is where it gets quite different than muscle. If we were to say muscle can benefit between 3 to 5 grams a day every day, you will get some muscle beneficial effects. We're starting to see about 20 grams a day is needed in the brain for, for periods of weeks, if not months. So that's the loading phase just for the brain. There's been a few studies that have shown some beneficial effects at lower dosages, but those individuals were diagnosed with depression on depressive medication. So if you take those studies away, the existing data, which is very small body of literature, is saying a really high dose is needed for subsequent uh, weeks on end. And when you look at that over time, if creatine can get into the brain, we see all these neurological conditions, concussion, traumatic brain injury, sleep deprivation, that naturally reduces brain creatine content. So by supplementing the diet, that could have some therapeutic effects. 
And when it comes to memory and cognition, this is really important. Aging adults seem to respond very well to improving cognition and memory. Younger individuals, we don't really see that effect at all. And if we do, it needs to be when the brain is stressed. So I always think of university students going through final exams, very, very stressed. Could creatine be an adjunct to proper sleep and diet and overall a healthy lifestyle to potentially maintain some memory or cognition? And some meta-analysis have shown some improvements primarily in older adults. Um, unfortunately, though, we're not seeing any improvement in individuals with Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, Parkinson's, or Huntington's. Uh, also, we're not seeing any good uh, benefits with multiple sclerosis. The, the, the probably logical reason for that is we need a lot more studies done in those clinical populations with very large sample sizes. Mm. We have, on the other hand, looking at it from a, a positive lens, seen some beneficial effects in stroke re rehabilitation populations, improving gait speed. Uh, but the big one is young boys with muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. This is a, a condition is based on a recessive gene that has been linked to excessive muscle and bone loss and functional impairments. And, and a, a few really good studies have looked at creatine with just activities of daily living and an improved bone health as well as muscle function. So there's some potential looking at neurophysiological or neuromuscular diseases. Um, but the biggest area of emergence is depression and anxiety. I think with COVID, especially depression and anxiety rates, I, I would guess have gone through the roof. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of promise. Uh, creatine acts as a neurotransmitter and reduces oxidative stress. And individuals with diagnosis of depression, and anxiety, maybe even PTSD, they have a reduction naturally in brain creatine content. So if you can give them more creatine through their diet or supplementation, that has been shown to have some promise by decreasing depressive symptoms. And we're starting to now look at that a lot in our lab, independent of depressive or anxiety medication. I think that's the key. We need to take away the medication. But from an ethics standpoint, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of potential promise there. Um, we're not really seeing any uh, big push on speech pathology or uh, sensory uh, issues. Um, but... There is two studies on concussion, which I think is the hottest topic. And there's a lot of press that if we can put creatine into the brain, we now know concussion substantially reduces the amount that's there. Can creatine act as a, a, an oxidative protective? Can it heal the, uh, uh, the tissues around certain areas of the brain, especially brain blood flow? And then the only two studies to ever look at this in children, these children were diagnosed with head trauma and immediately put on creatine or placebo. Uh, the dose was quite high, 0.4 gram per kilogram, and they measured them for multiple months later. And really surprisingly, the, the children that were on creatine really had significant improvements in speech, self-care, self-efficacy, whereas the, the children that didn't, uh, did not. So it showed that maybe creatine has potential to improve post-recovery of concussion. Mm. We don't know if you load or take creatine before you get a concussion, would it speed up the rates of recovery? That would mean you're taking athletes, dividing them up on creatine or placebo before they have a concussion. And God forbid, if they do, then you can measure it later. But I see application, obviously, you're in the United States, NCAA football or contact sport, UFC, mm. uh, boxing. This could have potential therapeutic benefits. All we can say is there's some small preliminary data to suggest it can improve symptoms of getting a concussion. We don't know. And we, we probably will never be able to tell, can it prevent a concussion? We don't think so. Mm, super, super interesting. Something you said earlier, um, in terms of like, the brain and cognition, mm -hmm. it seems to benefit older adults. Creatine seems to benefit older adults more than younger adults, unless those younger adults are under stress. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, is that because our brains are producing less creatine as we age? Is it because we just see <laughs> other associated changes in memory and cognition as we're aging? Like what's, do you, do you guys have a sense of what the mechanism is there? Yeah, it was a, a phenomenal study came out of Brazil by some of the leading researchers in creatine, uh, Bruno Guagliano and Hampton Rocha, and they looked at sex, diet, and age, and, and the effects of muscle versus brain. And the brain is very unique. Uh, it doesn't have any difference when, depending on vegetarians, plant-based diet, or omnivores, the brain creatine content remains relatively same. Uh, aging is relatively stable. It might be a little bit reduced. 
Um, but we don't know the biological or pathological processes going on with the aging brain, no different than your bicep, you know, sarcopenia. It's going to get smaller as we get older. The theory, just like any other muscle or organ in the, in the body, it may be jeopardized with uh, aging as well. So that could be coming into play is some of those tau proteins that we look at dementia and oxidative stress and things like that. So these are all areas for future research. I would guess we will be looking at creatine in the brain now for the next 50 years and mm -hmm. just get in the infancy of it. Yeah. It sounds like there's just a lot to explore yeah. there and, and a lot of potential and possibility for those clinical applications. Um, let's say hypothetically mm -hmm. you're uh, a woman, <laughs> let's say you're a woman and you're, uh, like maybe early fifties, mm -hmm. you're kind of on the cusp of, um, being postmenopausal and you are interested in, you know, like building strength and muscle mass, you know, is something that's important. Like you've, maybe you've listened to this podcast or other people out in the world yeah. and you're like, okay, I like, I need to preserve my, my muscle mass and, and build what I can. Um, you know, you're concerned about things like your bone density, bone strength. Um, but you're also concerned about some of these cognitive effects and you want to do like the most you can for your brain and, and that sort of thing. How would you approach dosing in that way, knowing mm -hmm. that the two are appear to be kind of leagues apart in terms of how you would dose that? Yeah. So I personally take at least 10 grams a day for the overall health. We haven't even talked about the immune system, which can mm -hmm. actually utilize creatine there as well. So if it's 10 grams a day and you're looking at it from a muscle, bone, and, and brain health perspective, and going quickly back to bone, the lowest dose was around eight grams. Mm. So here you are now, you're like, well, we know there's potential little issues with the loading phase, but you kind of are approaching that higher dose. I think you want to take smaller, more frequent dosages throughout the day and just hold on and get past that first week of the water retention. It will subside. Um, so it really comes down to why that individual is taking it. If you're not really concerned about going on stage or looking in the mirror and say, oh, I gained two pounds of water retention, I think the most population want to take something if they are considering uh, uh, creating supplementation in addition to exercise from a health perspective, I think smaller, more frequent dosages. Mm -hmm. So that could be as little as two to three grams a day, maybe three times a day. Uh, that, that's one way to do it. So I personally take at least five grams with breakfast. I drink five grams during my workout. And then on days I'm really metabolically stressed, writing boring grants or papers or whatever, I'll take another five grams. Mm -hmm. And I've been taking creatine ever since I've been 17. No mm -hmm. stoppage, no need to stoppage. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I sort of back what I research. And, and the big thing too, is I'm not just giving you a personal opinion here. I'm giving you everything evidence-based research. And I think that's really important when you have uh, academics opinion is okay, but you want to base it on facts. Um, and there's some things that creatine doesn't do. And at the end of the day, it only has a small little beneficial effect more than exercise alone. Um, so I always say it's a sprinkle or cherry on the cake. And that cake is exercise. I, I think if you're taking creatine without exercise, you may experience some small beneficial effects, but the magic of creatine is sure unlocked when you combine it with exercise. Yeah. I, that's the one thing I feel like is so um, it's so tough, right? We, even in the United States, I know Canadian, um, for example, um, physical activity recommendations are really similar to the U S but, you know, here in the U S we're, with, um, two muscle strengthening sessions a week and, um, 150 minutes minimum of moderate intensity cardio or 70, in Canada. Yeah, yeah. 75 minutes of vigorous cardio. Um, if you're going to swap in intensity, you know, I think that we have this, um, perhaps like in, our, at least I know in my bubble, it's like, we we're we're, we're talking about this stuff and it's like, people are pretty accepting and are really doing a great job with implementing, um, exercise as a health promoting habit and, and things of that nature. <clears throat> but it's like seeing the, the percentage of folks who are still yet to, to come on board, especially with the strength training element, you know, it's like women oh, um, between the ages of 18 and 64 here in the States. Um, I think it's like one in five, you yeah. know, thereabouts is doing and meeting both the minimums for the muscle strengthening, um, and the cardiovascular okay. stuff. So it's like, you're right without like, it, it's, it's, it's hard for people who aren't quite mastering that those habits, those, these things they do up and show up consistently for every day. Mm -hmm. And I think to hear then like, oh, I've got to take this supplement on top of it. I think some people are a little bit like, you know, what should I focus on first? What's yep. the most important? Mm -hmm. 
but I can, I can definitely appreciate that. And I think, you know, the more we can kind of work on those things in tandem, yeah. um, you know, exercise doesn't have to be like a boring, horrible thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can find what you like and, yeah. and really continuing that on through yeah. as long as you physically can is mm. so, so important. Yeah, I totally agree. Start as young as you can. That myth about exercise and children development is a is one of the biggest myths ever created. Mm. No different than protein hurting your kidneys. Yeah. It, it, don't don't worry about any supplement. Don't worry about any supplement. The key there is a supplement. Food first, mm-hmm. proper sleep, and move the body. The body was meant to move. And and unfortunately in society, we're extremely sedentary. COVID locked everybody in their house. And mm. and I'm just waiting for the data to come out on the chronic diseases that's COVID calls from inactivity. And there, there's come up some phenomenal benefits. We're now looking at home-based exercise with rubber tubing as a viable strategy for people in long-term care facilities. So we got to move the body. It doesn't have to be continuous, but if you can throw in some type of resistance training, carrying groceries, shoveling the driveway, that, that still counts. Mm-hmm. And I think if you say, I need to get 150 minutes in a week or however you want to do it, it is very viable. And please note, there's only five supplements that the IOC even says are effective. And of those five, the effects are very small. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these might just give you a small extra boost. It's caffeine, beta alanine, beetroot juice, sodium bicarbonate, and creatine. Mm -hmm. Protein is a food first uh, uh, supplement. But people are always asking about Joe Blow's Mega Mass 9000. I heard it does this. (laughs) It doesn't. You probably excrete this down the toilet uh, quite often. So there's only a few out there. And what I just talked about, the majority are found in food. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're a plant-based individual, a vegetarian or vegan, getting creatine is going to be very difficult. And maybe that's why supplementation is looked at. But from protein perspective, you can get all the protein you want from all your plant-based proteins. You just need to eat a little bit more. And Mm -hmm. and I think we're so hell-bent on pills and powders as the magic cure. Nothing is magic. It takes a lot of work to do. And, And I agree with you. If we would just move the body put less pressure on ourselves about how we look. There's so many things influencing your metabolism and and just try to eat better. And if you have the luxury of of entertaining a supplement, if you need it, maybe you're deficient in vitamin D, maybe you get a multivitamin. These are little things that can just help, but nothing will replace exercise. If you were to ask me, what's the best thing for a fountain of youth or anti-aging, it's exercise. And if you exercise at a higher intensity more often, uh, if you're riding your bike outside and there's a hill, try to do it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just little things can add up. Um, If you have a chance to walk through the store instead of driving, take advantage of that and record the number of steps on your phone or watch. These are little things you can do if you're working in an office job. Drink a lot more water, go to the bathroom more often. That includes (laughs) steps. So it's not difficult, but I think we said, well, if I can't work out in the gym with barbells and dumbbells 60 minutes a day, yep. I barely have time to take care of things in my, in my life. How am I going to exercise? And we're, humans are very lazy. We have Prime and Netflix and everything, and the shows are great. And, and now there's no commercials, so you don't even have an excuse to get up and move around. That's so true. I think we're going a little bit backwards, but I, I just yeah. would hope move more often if working out in the morning is the best for you, great. There's no perfect time. Just do what's the best for you. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have to get up early to do it, go to bed earlier. I mean, nothing really happens good later in the evening when you're watching Netflix and and sitting on the couch. So maybe you go to bed a bit earlier and get up earlier. It's some little strategies you can adopt. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, One that a lot of people in my community have been doing, and I've been doing for um, a while now as well as rucking. So just throw on a a weighted backpack as you're doing your walk, especially if you feel like, you know, you've been, you've developed a walking habit and you're just trying to like maybe eke a little bit into, you know, a little bit more intensity or go walk up a hill, um, you know, those sorts of things to your point about like, you know, not avoiding that hill on your bike, but yeah. like take, take on that challenge. Yeah. Um, I think those are all really great practical yeah. tips for people. Yeah. Um, one, I think one more question that I have is, yeah. and I've been hearing this a lot is, um, the idea of creatine non-responders mm-hmm. and, um, there are sort of like incidents, at least in maybe the, um, experimental populations yes. that you've seen, because quite often I'll hear from people, Hey, I've been taking creatine for a while. Um, I just don't feel any different. I don't know if people even know what to expect that yeah. they're going to feel or notice. Yeah. So I would love if you touch on that as maybe a last question, and then we'll kind of wrap things up. Yeah. So the responder non-responder issue is legitimate and it's only from a muscle perspective. So please note it's not from a bone or brain because we haven't got there yet. Mm. So when someone says I've taken creatine 
And I didn't triple the amount of weight I can lift because that's what I thought creatine did. And no, it's not multiple anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. It's a natural product you're consuming and producing in the diet. So when people say I'm a non-responder, what that means is your response to creatine is primarily dictated by four things. But by far, the biggest issue is the amount you naturally already have in your muscle. So from a muscle perspective, we have a maximal capacity put in layman's terms, about 180 grams to 200 grams of potential capacity for creatine. A vegan only has about 80 to 100 grams at rest. So a vegetarian or vegan should respond very well. They would be considered a responder because you're technically having the ability to double the amount of creatine in the muscle. But if you take someone on a carnivore, carnivore diet who eats red meat and seafood, they might already be near the ceiling. So if you take a supplement, they may not respond at all. And they say, hey, I didn't notice any increase in repetition or weight. So the initial amount of creatine in your muscle is by far the most primary factor. The second is age and sex. There is evidence that females do not respond the same way from a muscle building perspective compared to males. And they don't seem to have the anti-catabolic effects. The females re respond very well from a muscle strength perspective. But if you were to take a group of males and a group of females, on average, the male is going to get a larger amount of muscle mass over time. So maybe some females especially may not respond as well. Same with aging. There is some evidence that uh, older adults have reduced creatine in their, in their muscles. That's why we see that they, these populations respond well over time. And the fourth one is your habitual dietary intake. Creatine is naturally found in high amounts in red meat and seafood. If you don't consume any of those products, you may experience a greater response. But if you're consuming a steak a day and maybe salmon, you may not respond as well. So those are the four big areas, but by far it's the initial amount in your muscle. I appreciate that. Um, in your opinion, is it still worth considering taking um, even for the, like we were talking about the above the neck and some of the other yeah. uh, non-muscle, you know, uh, benefits that people can experience? Yeah, hundred percent to get that high amount of creatine per day, even on an omnivore or carnivore diet is really difficult. Again, the responder idea was based on muscle performance perspective, but we have no idea how much you need as a responder for bone and brain. And if it is 10, 20 grams for the brain over a long period of time, that's very difficult to get. There's probably about three to four grams in a large red meat steak or two servings of seafood. So you'd have to be eating pretty much meat all day long, seven days a week to get the same response. Whereas you could consider a, a supplement. The cool thing with creatine is, do you need to supplement? No, you can get the basic small amount needed to maintain your baseline levels naturally through your diet or what you consume through food products because we synthesize about one to three grams per day. So does someone absolutely need creatine? 100% no. A lot of vegetarians and vegans can exercise and be healthy their whole life. Creatine just may give an extra small beneficial effect. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, last question, I guess, is like, what are you working on now that you're you're really jazzed about? Uh, mm -hmm. Anything interesting coming coming in the pipeline for you? Yeah, we have a huge uh, creatine and brain health paper that's hopefully coming out in the next few uh, months. And then we also, in our lab, we have a number of studies planned. We're going to now look at depression and anxiety in young females mm -hmm. post exercise. And we're going to really put the, the, the question to rest. Does the timing of creatine at different times of the day really matter? We have two unique studies that will sort of answer that as well. And then the big shift is on individuals diagnosed with sarcopenia or older adults. We now want to look at creatine and home-based exercise. They can stay in the comfort of their own home. We go to their home and do the assessments with portable equipment. And that could be very viable for individuals that are shut-ins, long-term care facilities, or God forbid another pandemic comes up, they can mm -hmm. still exercise at home. So there's seven or eight studies ongoing or planned and quite a few papers already in review and things like that. So I love it. It, it Hopefully it never ends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise with us and walking through some of these different subtleties. Um, I think it's really important for people to hear from folks like you who are the primary researchers in these fields, frankly, you know, putting in the long, hard hours and trying to just help 
us better understand how things work. Like how can we not only find the edges of like human performance, but also from a more general population point of view, um, with, with health and well-being and, and all the challenges that go on in this world. So I really appreciate you, the things that you all are doing. And, um, I think the more people can hear from the, the people behind the research <laughs> in the studies and, um, you know, hear your passion. I think it's very, very, uh, very contagious. And, um, I, I really think it helps people to, to have that humanized element too, of like, these are real people <laughs> doing this research who <laughs> yes. really do, really do care and, and, um, are trying to help us all better understand collectively. So I awesome. appreciate well, Thank it. you for the opportunity. It was great. And, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, um, I look forward to seeing all of your new studies that are coming out. We'll definitely share those out as they come great. out in the world and, uh, help get, help get folks more interested in the creatine conversation. All right. Thanks again. It was great. I had a good Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode with Dr. Darren Kandau. I hope you learned something about bone health, brain health, aging, creatine, and really where the frontiers of creatine research are headed. I know that I appreciate very much his time on the show today. Make sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you're not already listening on YouTube, head over there, hit subscribe as well, and ring the bell for more notifications to see when new videos get posted. Of course, if you're ready to just start putting things into practice, you know, there's no more time to, to waste. You really want to get going on your strength, muscle mass performance, then head over and apply for strength nutrition unlocked. And we'd love to have a conversation with you to see if you're a great fit for the program. You can do that at stephgaudreau.com slash apply. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And until next time, stay strong.